I'm sitting on the stage of Verdriet is a Ding met Vere, the adaptation of the novel Grief is a Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. I am very happy that the theater makers Erik Wien and Jacob Derwig are here with me and that the author Max Porter can be with us via a live video link. Max Porter's masterly debut appeared in 2015. It is a profound meditation on love and loss. A grieving, a grieving writer and father of two young boys is coming to terms with the death of his wife while a crow takes over the house. The book is a freewheeling hybrid of novella, poem, essay, and play for voices. It is darkly funny and deeply resonant. And now it is a play as well. A beautiful and moving play by Theater Rotterdam. I will be talking to the writer Max Porter, the director Erik Wien, and the actor and adapter of the novel Jacob Derwig about the most important themes in grief. It's a thing with feathers and its translation to the stage. And maybe I'll even learn to screech like a crow. Max, thank you for joining us. We are sitting here uh, in a theater. Where are you at the moment? I'm sitting in my small office in my house in Bath in the southwest of England. Is this the place where you work as well? Yes, this is where I work. Um, it's a small room. I, to, the, to my right is uh, a little garden where I have a plastic zebra who keeps me company. And to my left, I have um, my son's PlayStation. So I, I hear him gaming while I write. <laughs> uh, can you work when he's gaming? Uh, yes, I, 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 he wears his headphones and I, and I confiscate his microphone if, if it's getting too noisy. But generally, I mean, more broadly, can I work with the children in the house? Yes, absolutely. I, I thrive on their noise. Um, I, I draw a great deal of energy as a, as a writer and I, I guess as a thinker from the language and behavior of children. <laughs> uh, people here can go to a brothel, but they can't go to the theater. Uh, what is the situation, the corona situation like in the UK? Uh, now. Okay. This is the week uh, we opened up uh, yesterday. From yesterday we could go um, to the theatre socially distanced in masks and go inside other people's homes. So I will see my uh, family, I'll see my little nephew for the first time in a year uh, this week. So it's an exciting, nervous, uh, odd, as you know, um, peculiarly uh, stressed and uh, there's something it, there's something very peculiar about it atmospherically, isn't there? There's this this uncertainty, this um, the science, the uh, you know the the, the, the new normal. Um, so we're we're I think our theatres are a little way behind you, but uh, it's looking good. A, a friend of mine's show is opening this week, which is a, a great thing for that sector of the culture industry, which has been under enormous pressure. Grief is the thing with feathers has already been brought to the stage in the UK. Uh, the renowned playwright Edna Balls uh, adapted your book in 2018 and Silly Murphy played the role of the father and the, and the crow. W what is it like for an author to uh, as his work uh, adapted and to see the characters um, come to, uh, brought to life on stage? It's a very odd combination of things. It's extremely um, humbling, obviously, flattering, um, inspiring. I, I drew a great deal, I still draw a great deal of inspiration from seeing my work translated into another medium. My books are becoming more play-like, I think, in response to the ways in which the material and the text has been translated onto the stage. Uh, quite revelatory in that respect. Um, I, I'm very interested in trust and I like the idea that you trust your collaborators um, and, and so far I've been um, really blown away by the, the level of engagement with the work. Uh, emotional, aesthetic, philosophical, practical problem solving of how to take a book like this which contains uh, a great deal of ambivalence, uh, ambiguity and, and how to make it real uh, and there's lots of decisions available to, to the to the translators um and so i find it very curious um and, and, and odd, i mean particularly because it's in this instance um the work is already at one remove having been translated into another language so one of the most startling things for me is uh the emotional impact it can it can have even if i don't understand it the, you know the, the various different how the kind of the different weaponry is available to a novelist, so so things like plot and characterization and pacing and, and in the line rhythm and syntax and energy, how those things change um, or or weirdly, perhaps more weirdly, don't change 
uh, in another language, another medium. So I find it um, honestly quite mind blowing. Um, my, we'll talk perhaps about my feelings about this adaptation, but um, it, it, I was left reeling, frankly, on, on almost every level. You know, emotionally, as, as the author of the work, but also as, as as a reader of the work, but also as a as a spectator, as a member of the audience. It um, it, it really um, knocked my socks off and got me thinking about all sorts of all sorts of things to do with interpretation and meaning and intent, um, but also the relationship between human beings and the stories they tell. Um, so yeah, so far, uh, I, I just feel profoundly lucky that such brilliant and intelligent and soulful people have decided to make work based on this work. And to what extent are you I involved or do you give, uh, for example, your second novel, Lenny, will be made into a film by the BBC. Do you give film and theatre makers complete freedom to adapt your work? I try to. Uh, I I try to, yeah. I, I think it, that, you know, collaboration is a sort of religion of mine and, and I and I like the idea that people bring different skill sets, um, a different set of, um, you know, life experiences and, and indeed, you know, emotional experiences to bear on the work and I shouldn't be a part of that. It should be a handing over. But I love to be involved. I, I am a very collaborative person. I love to uh, see what's going on. I mean, I, I, you know, when I wrote to Eric, I just said, just tell me, tell me what decisions you're making. I'm interested. Um, I think you can't put work out into the world and not be interested in how it changes and grows and organically shifts in different contexts. So I, I, I want to be curious, but not, um, I don't want to meddle. Uh, there are some things I don't want to adapt. You know, Lanny, I didn't want to adapt. I was happy to hand it over to someone else. Uh, uh, and in that case, particularly to a, to a female screenwriter and a female director and a female producer i felt that that was the right decision for that and they needed to take it and make it uh, a vehicle for a certain type of female storytelling um with with grief I, i've been so sort of profoundly um happy and interested by the way that Jakob and eric and anander and killian have uh, changed and molded and, and in fact put themselves in what what's so what's so amazing to me is, is the way that the adapters put themselves into the work and i can only see that as a much more preferable thing than it's still being only about me i mean it was mine for ages I, it's the worst thing that it would only be mine and that i would seek to have some control over the meaning of the book i want it out there especially this book which is um which has wings uh, and and should be cronking in other languages and invoking other emotional or political environments it should be crow you know a dutch crow does not sound the same as english crow mm. and i want to hear that i'm interested in other languages and other other modes of experience thank you uh jacob you worked with eric together on the theater version of revolutionary road i i saw it here in, the, in this theater why did you want to adapt uh, max porter's book well, we're looking for another piece of theater to do to work with um, i love working with eric um, my favorite director i want to i wanted to find some material i could really um, put my teeth in as we say in dutch and um, we both had uh, read this book and were swept away by it but immediately found the difficulties mm -hmm. in uh, how to adapt it and maybe that was um what, what are th the that was the challenges of course it's not a well-made play it's not a, it's not a play so you have to um make a lot of decisions um trying to honor the work and trying to honor the poetry of it and the, the emotional impact of it and making well some kind of psychological arch in it mm -hmm. but the book is it's 88 pieces Right yeah, and um, chapters. chapters, very short chapters, longer chapters, some sometimes one sentence, and um, we thought the play needed some arch, so some well from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to mold characters into it as well. If you read the book, you only find the chapters crow, boys, and father, um, and we wanted to make two boys out of it. Mm -hmm. So that was. There was, were a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, choices to be made. Eric, you both read the, the script of uh, Edna Walls and you knew immediately this is not the way we're going to do it. Why you didn't uh, like the script uh, or the way it was well, adapted? It, it only had to do with one thing, that we missed the boys in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, they're very important. Of course, all the attention goes to Crow in, at, at the first because he's a, 
how do you say how does Crow describes himself in the end? A glypert. He's he's a how do a you trickster. Say a trickster. So he's the he's the ego, and then of course the father. He has the 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 how do you say the emotional uh, problem. <laughs> His mm -hmm. wife died, and then of course the boys, the silent watchers and listeners, and and we fell in love with with those characters as well. So the script uh, and the mate was very good. I mean, he he opened our eyes. Uh, uh, in a way, like okay, it can you can put it on stage. So mm -hmm. that was sort of a invitation, a, a comfort, uh, so, yeah, an invitation. But yeah, that it's just mm -hmm. yeah, it's also about the boys. In in the credit says that Eric is the director and Jakob is is the adapter. Uh, don't these two roles merge? How, uh, could you describe how you how you work together? I made the first version. Mm -hmm. um, Eric was pleased with that, and then we worked <laughs> well eight, nine, ten sessions together mm -hmm. or make or uh, in making it better. And is there is one of uh, one of uh, you uh, the crow, or uh, is there a, uh, what kind of mechanism or what kind of? Uh, well, I think um, my point of view is the the one of the actor. So mm -hmm. I have some kind of antenna for can we play this scene. Uh, who's in it? Can we make a dialogue out of it? Is this a monologue? Whose monologue is mm. it? So these were the initial choices. And this was a first version I could uh, hand to Eric so he could start working and start his imagination mm. about it. M Max, uh, I've read the book, I think, two or three years ago. And, and normally I don't remember sentences. I'm not good at it. But there's one sentence that's still in my head and, and never left my head. And uh, that is that in the book you, uh, you say for the boys, it is the best possible time to lose a mom. C can you explain um, this sentence? Why is it the best possible time? Well, I think the point of that line is that there's something inherently cruel and mm -hmm. uh, possibly masochistic uh, and, and, and wildly uh, preposterous and untrue in that line. Mm -hmm. But that there, there is also in it the kind of vain, glorious, bombastic um, kernel of, of something approaching Emily Dickinson's formulation of hope being this thing that grows in the soul. So I like the idea of a brother saying to himself slash his brother, to either you nor you or me in this uh, in this game of brothering um, wasn't it an okay time? Weren't we lucky? Basically, the, the 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 gratitude of the person who received good care, good parenting, good brothering, good sibling love, uh, but also possibly the great question of the book that the therapeutic uh, impact of of the visiting crow um, that who 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 helped them realize that despite um, the, temp the shattering of their temporal reality, their ability to time travel through through pain and through loss and trauma, to see themselves as children when they're adults, see themselves as adult when they're children, that ultimately they came to uh, a sort of reconciliation of the broken person within time mm -hmm. to say it was okay, to, it, it was a good time, we were boys, we could play these games. I think in a way it's an anti-adult sentiment. It suggests that adults lose the ability or lose some of the faculties, emotional faculties, to to do these things, to to learn from animals, to be non-human, to shriek and roar and meld and shapeshift um, and become one another, and all the things that I think uh, make grieving one of the more beautiful facets of, of human life and human consciousness. You lost your father when you were young, um, but you decided to write a book about the death of a mother. Was it necessary to uh, to distance yourself from your own story? It was for me then, um, yes, I think it helped, partly because there was some stuff with my father that was too close to the bone and I didn't want to hurt anybody. Uh, books shouldn't hurt people uh, where, wherever possible. <laughs> and also um, distance is helpful, I think. I was learning, it was a private exercise. I didn't expect it to have a readership. I certainly didn't expect six years later to be talking to you know, a couple of uh, you know, Dutch dramatic geniuses adapting it. This has all been a surprise. Um, so at that time, when I was locked into it, it was it was really working out what is what are the 
possibilities of fiction. Um, what is what, what? What, for example, does it mean to set one thing up quite abstractly, uh, say in a kind of fairy tale, and set it against something um, more domestic or, or, or more mundane? You know, I was playing around with the different energies created by things, and, and I found that memoir lacked a certain energy or, or inhibited me in a certain way, and actually going into the fairy tale mode, translating it from a father to a mother gave me the possibility, almost directorial actually, it makes me think of, of, of what you're saying, uh, Eric and Jacob, in the kind of conversation between you both, it, it allows you to have a conversation, almost to collaborate with oneself. So zoom up, show it from a different angle, show it from a bird, show it from underneath, show it as if they're models on a stage and I can move them around. So beginning to figure that, that all out for myself, really. Yeah, Jacob, you've, you've been spared the experience of profound grief, but you said in an interview that this production is good practice. What can, what can we learn from it? I'm not sure. I haven't uh, experienced this profound grief myself. Um, but reading the book and being touched by it immediately, so profoundly, shows that the book is more than just uh, comfort to people in grief. Mm -hmm. It touches uh, things on a more universal level, on a more on level of life, I think, on a level of brother love and, and, and uh, the, the loyalty f to parents or it says something about courage, it says something about um, life energy, something like that. Are you now less uh, frightened for for death or for grief or? I don't know. <laughs> the, the monster hasn't reached me until now, so um, it touches people in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the small audiences we've had all all were touched and moved and brought to their own mm -hmm. uh, process of grief, but also people not being um, visited by these uh, profound periods of grief uh, are, are touched. Mm -hmm. Eric, uh, uh, in one of the interviews I read that the, that the production is, or the, the piece is also an ode to, to fatherhood. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, seen the, I've, seen the, I've seen the play and I, I've, I saw a lot of uh, drudgery. Uh, the character of, of Jacob is really struggling. And can, and I, can you be a good father uh, while struggling? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, if you if you allow yourself to uh, show that to your boys, to your kids, that you're struggling, bec the boys in the play or in the book, they they absolutely f forgive him. They love him. They mm -hmm. tell that in the end, we, we love our father, we miss our mother, and we wave to crows. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so you can be a father, but you you, 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 you cannot be the father you you thought you could be. So you have to destroy that image and just sit with it. That's so beautiful about this story that uh, I was thinking about it when you asked Jacob, are you less scared now? Uh, this, I mean, of course, everyone is scared of, of losing someone of grief and pain. And But this dad also, he, he Crow is just, he, he, he only, he lets him in. He, he said to Crow, is like, can I come in? And, mm -hmm. and then he the the he has this how do you say bittersweet Max eh? bittersweet mm -hmm. and he says hello crow <laughs> nice to meet you and then he, he, yeah it's the game is on mm -hmm. then you say uh, well go and mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, yeah I, I want to watch a clip from from the play um, I think we all can see it. Says one for the good days. I have it Wait, all it in red, blue, green, and red, blue, green. Sommige dingen herken ik. Ik geloof je. Ik geloof je volkomen. Ik voel het heel vertrouwd. Dankjewel, Kraai. Dat is bij de service inbegrepen. Nee. Nee, echt, Kraai. Dankjewel. When I spin away out of control on video. 
zei laatst tegen een vriend. Ze zou zo boos op me zijn geworden dat ik te laat was weggereden bij dat voetbaltoernooi. Want daardoor kwamen we midden in die vakantiefile terecht. Nou, je moet uh, ophouden er overal bij te betrekken hoor. Er is zoiets als rouw en zoiets als een onpraktische obsessie. Nou, ik was al altijd uh, onpraktisch geobsedeerd door haar. Dus... Hey, uh, loop je bij iemand huh? om erover uh, te praten? Uh, ja. 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 En, uh, is het een goeie? Ja, ja. Hij is heel goed, ja. Huh? Ja. Je moet lachen bij het idee van kraai in de spreekkamer. Kraai die een factuurtje uitpikt. Een wijsbriefje van de huisarts naar dokter kraai. Kraai die vergoed wordt door de verzekering. Nee, maak je geen zorgen, ik krijg hulp. Dankjewel. Dankjewel. Niks te danken. Maar je denkt erom dat ik nog altijd jouw Ted's dichterlijke legende ben. Kraai van de dodelijke keelte. Vergeet dat nooit. De godverslindende, vuilnislikkende, woordvermoordende, karkas onterende klootzak en al die dingen meer. Beautiful. Uh... Max, what is it like to see this? How do you feel about it? I feel uh, really, <laughs> really humbled. You know, I was I was in pieces when I watched it. Um, huh. Partly because, um, well, as I say, partly because of this distance. It's it's not in my language, and yet I feel it. So it's somehow in my it's in my soul language, in my spirit language. Um, which which teaches me a lot about the capabilities of the human heart that I could be moved by something I don't necessarily understand but also I, I I'm familiar with the work but I'm not familiar with the body language of these people reinterpreting it so what really struck me as being quite radically brilliant actually about the interpretation here the adaptation is the way that they listen to one another and teach one another to tell the story so you've got three different crows you've even in a weird way you've got three different versions of each character because one brother beholds the other brother and the other brother is formed in one's heart and over time so in a way you're kind of lit you're trapped uh in the weather system of a family's growth it's 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 like watching a time-lapse video of, of plants growing and they grow off obviously in unexpected directions and and humor is such a is is almost the water of the piece because pain is the pain is the it, <laughs> I don't know why I'm choosing a gardening allegory right <laughs> but pain is the, is the is the garden that we, that they are all living in mm -hmm. but the, but humor somehow the generosity of spirit in the way that the dad watches and encourages and guides them and the way that they guide and encourage their father in in the telling and the creation of this this myth that is utterly bespoke to them. What, what, what's so extraordinary to me watching this play is I've never, it's completely new to me because it's theirs. These three people have created, well, if you include the rest of the team, you, you 15, 20 people have created something utterly bespoke, utterly unique to yourselves, uh, which, which for, for a writer, I mean, the, the possibility of that is incredible. The potential is so inspiring that I might think, how does a character listen to another character in a book how can that happen off the page because it has to happen in the mind of the reader uh, like i as i'm just very inspired and excited by that as a as a as a form of care and a form of attention you know from one human being to another it, it's miraculous jacob Crow is a, is a big disruptor he uh, turns the house inside out um he seems always a bit out of breath uh, how is it to perform him out of breath, it feels out of um, How does it feel? Um, of course, it's. I'm still playing dad, and dad has these outbursts of crow. It, it is, is a way out for him. Mm -hmm. uh, when crow wasn't there, dad will totally, well, collapse, right? Implode. Mm -hmm. Now he can explode. Mm -hmm. And this is the way he can deal with the the bizarre feelings of grief and and uh, in a way um give give his uh, give give an expression to his feelings mm -hmm. so it's not playing another character it's playing dad being weird mm -hmm. and um well there's one rule for playing crow uh, anything goes anything goes do, 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 sorry yes max 
I was just going to ask Jacob whether it felt cathartic or, uh, in any way for you as a human. Did it feel good to be animal, to, to unleash certain? Because you're so, um, you're frightening when you become crow. I wonder whether that felt good uh, and, and possibly might, might you kind of recommend it as crow does at the end, like as a form of therapy for people that are slightly struggling in their human skin, be a bit more crow? Um, I don't know if I would re recommend it because it, I have to come a long way. Right, rehearsal day one, Crow wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. So there were small steps. I always need to believe in myself what I do. And Eric was constantly pushing me, <laughs> let go, let him go, let go, Crow, go, Crow. It can never be too scary or too weird or too funny or too. And in a way, too it is cathartic to be so expressive and do not care at all if people follow me in the audience or mm -hmm. if I frighten my own sons or so it's it's cathartic for that and it's, it's cathartic for me in a way and and uh, eric do the do the boys perform him differently when, crow? when, when, when yeah crow when they are crow uh, yeah yeah they uh, we 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 had to search for uh the characters because max wrote one voice mm -hmm. so we had to uh mold two boys and of course the actors bring in their own stuff mm -hmm. or their own Personality. personalities or their own relationship with their dads. So, uh, yeah, two two boys, two crows. Yeah. Luckily, it, it's, it's uh, in a way, it's, it, it's, uh, it's really fell, uh, how do you say, uh, in, in place. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but because what, yes, sorry? Now, the, the uh, Jesse and Romain who, pl who play uh, the, the, the boys, mm -hmm. yeah, they... They connected with the pieces Jakob and I also uh, uh, selected for the voice. I think maybe one or two parts we, we Shif sw shifted during rehearsals and this is not boy one or this mm -hmm. is not boy two. Yeah, but it was a joy to, to create two boys. What, what would be missing if, if, the, if Crow would have been played by a separate actor? Have you thought of it? Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, then he would, at first, he, he would have become real. Mm -hmm. Like, so you have a dad, two boys, and a crow. Mm -hmm. And he's imaginary and real. So it, it, it was, a, a, uh, it was a, a character that you could uh, 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 grab or you, you could, someone gave it and to you. And yeah. by playing him, the, the father and the boys... Uh, Come. Yeah, and, and if uh, and of course the crow, the boys are crow as well. They they mourn. They have grief too. Mm -hmm. And crow is is a ghost, as you say, or is imaginary and is fluid. And so, it, at one point there are three crows. Of course there are three crows. Mm -hmm. And 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 in the end he's gone. There wasn't a crow after all. So mm -hmm. yeah. M Max, yeah. Um, um, a crow uh, uh, flies straight out of the poetry of uh, Ted Hughes. Um, uh, can you tell a bit, because I, I read in, in the newspaper that you, uh, the, you've been called a, a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, what, what sort of character is Crow in his poetry? Oh, um, Does he speak the same language as, 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 as your Crow? No, very different. I had to make him very, very different. You wouldn't want him to be Hughes's crow. <laughs> Hughes's crow is a very black and, and, and traumatic thing, but also fed on trickster myths and Eastern European poetry and, and all sorts of things. And it's very much of its time. It was written in a traumatic period in, in Ted Hughes's life, and it speaks of anger at God, anger at the bomb. Um, there's all sorts of vicious... Um, misogynistic, implied and actual violence. In, and, and so I thought... Uh, that that's boring to take a, to, to to steal someone else's character and properly plop it in. It has to be put through the filter of this man's obsession. So the man, the dad, could have been uh, obsessed with the songs of Bob Marley, or um, you know, obsessed with the, you know the paintings of uh, of Rembrandt, and, and the obsession would look and taste and be flavoured differently. Um, but the important thing, I think, is is the sort of is the, is the tricks to template the crows themselves because I included in, in my crow um, a lot more self deprecation or self knowledge of, of the sort of postmodern era. He's a he's a he's a postmodern crow. He knows he's been the subject of essays. He's a kind of celebrity crow. He knows he's been in all sorts of books and films, um, and he knows that he can be drawn from different 
global literary tradition. So, which is what's so wonderful to see him translated back into others. You know, the Catalan crow is different to the Dutch mm. crow, is different to a Korean crow. The main thing I think is, is, is what Eric said about him being a trickster. He is play. Um, and that is, I think, the, I suppose, the heart of the book um, is that he knows that human beings are incredibly resilient. You can poke them, you can tease them, you can hurt them, and they will, they will find a way of telling, of telling them stories out of it. Um, he's also incredibly bleak. There's no point denying it. You know, my crow is, uh, is horrible and he mocks them and he's, and he's cruelty in body, but in, in that cruelty, we ultimately find love. There's, there's uh, one big difference. Yes, I am a nerd. <laughs> yeah. Can you cite a poem? <laughs> oh, can I read a crow? No, I, no, I don't know crow off by heart. Because the other thing is that I really feel like I, I was that stuff is very bound up with my um, painful things, and I and I wanted this book to move on from that. I think it's important, you know, to with an obsession. I think it's important that you you be become aware of how it has its claws into you, and then at a certain point step that to one side and write something new about it, you know? Uh, in, in the book, the, the siblings speak in one voice. You, you made two characters out of it. And uh, there are three, uh, four voices in the book. Uh, uh, and the mother is also important, but she has no voice in the book. But we hear her in, in the play. Could you tell a bit more about that, why you decided to do that, and, and what happens then? Well, that actually is Anna Walsh's idea or or Max and Enda I don't know who came up with that in the in the script but um, when we read that so there's a piece there's one chapter in the book mm -hmm. uh, I think it's one of the boys who tells the story of dad going to Oxford and it's a Jewess reading and and then it, it, somewhere in the end he says uh, mom always tells this story right or something yeah. like that or she she cried at the first time that and and so that was the entrance of the, okay this is a, this is a story that belongs mm -hmm. to her that sits with her and well the emotional impact every night when after one hour and 15 minutes you suddenly they stop talking and one of the boys has a cassette and he like it's from 20 years ago and and they they listen to their mother because in our adaptation the boys aren't uh, young mm -hmm. they're they're 25 mm -hmm. and one of them says he he, he's got a kid of his own. So you watch three uh, men. So that's also, uh, it's not about a father and two boys. It's about three men. But so the emotional, hearing her and, and on tape and Jacob plays piano uh, uh, very beautifully. Yeah, it's, it, it, every night it moves me. Are you moved uh, when you when you uh, when when you are acting? Because you said when I read the book, uh, it it moves me. Yeah. What what happens if you if you play? Well, I used to think that as an actor, uh, I should move the audience and not myself. Mm -hmm. But in a certain way, playing this character or this roller coaster, uh, ninety minutes emotional play. Um, I'm moved myself every time, so uh, I do a bit of crying after the ninety minutes, and then I you do, <laughs> yeah, because you it it it, it, it gets into me, mm -hmm. and um, I know where it happens. It's and this is uh, as Max always says says about this. It's the the beauty of it is that they're listening to each other. Mm -hmm. There's patience. There's rage, and there's. Um, the decision has been made to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. And when these boys, Je Jesse and Romain, play this so wonderfully, and there's a moment, so 10 minutes before the end, and I just can watch mm -hmm. their uh, few monologues about their own grief and how they see their father. This is so moving. Mm -hmm. this, uh, then it hits me. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you, you, there's one page in, in the book at the end, which is which is blank. Is, is that correct to say? Uh, it's before the ashes are scattered. C uh, wh why do you use a blank page? Uh, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, 
and and uh, we saw it at the at the at the stage of the proof page proofs being put together, and and it was like a ghost I, in the room. I I said that's brilliant, and they said that's an accident, and I said you must keep it. It's it, the book is it utilizes blank space in many different ways, but mm -hmm. I thought that that there was this page that isn't even numbered. It isn't even part of the architecture of the book. It, it is pure pause. It's pure emptiness for you to project yourself into as a reader. I thought it was a beautiful thing. Um, but just to pick up on what Jakob was saying, you know, uh, th there is some, um, I think novel novels need to be self-conscious about how novels work and using things like the page and where the language is on the page and where you break a line and stuff. And I'm very interested in that. And I, and I love, I think the novel is still radical form. And similarly, a theatre needs to be interested in what, what it means to stage a drama and, and for people to be acting and for there to be lights and sound and an audience and people sitting still listening to you perform something and the radical possibilities of that, that relationship. And I think, I mean, I was absolutely in, I was in tears watching them perform this play when I watched when I watched it in rehearsals and and I think that one of the reasons is watching Jacob look at his sons those those boys uh, and hear them as if they were speaking the truth. There's a certain truthfulness to the adaptation that that gets right to the heart of why theatre is so powerful um, and and I love the idea that that surprises an actor or involves an actor beyond the artifice of the theatre and creates a kind of hyper-artificiality, hyper which is truth, because I feel that that's the point of my writing in a weird way. So they've made an incredibly novel-like novel -like play, um, which has taught me a great deal about why I might want to carry on writing novels. And I hope in the same way it would teach them why they want to keep on making theatre. Um, and I think it is definitely to do with human to human as you, as he said, wait the, the waiting, the silence, the moments when you're not saying anything, but you're watching this thing grow and develop and change in front of you. Is, yeah. there, is there something like a blank page in, in on stage, or is it the music you use? Uh, well, the music. No, I maybe uh, when the mother is speaking mm -hmm. for the boy. Ah, no. Uh, it's a hard question. I don't know. If is there a blank Maybe page between on, on two stage? and three, when the boys leave, yeah, you're and the father's left mm -hmm. alone yeah. at the piano, yeah, then our third yeah. uh, part starts. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little. I, blank. I also yeah. think. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I, I think in a way the blank, the function of the blank page you achieve with the use of the microphones and the and the the pause before the decision to perform a story yeah. or to sing a song. Yeah. So yeah. they're like, hang on, hang on, I can't <laughs> do this. I need yeah. the piano. Or hang on, yeah. wait, 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 wait. We need to sing this one. You know that yeah. decision that. That, that, you, that there's represent, representational choices available to you. Like, is this a song? Is this a story? Is this a yeah. screen? Is this a moment I need to disappear? And then they do it. It's yeah. like uh, it's like finding your. It's like fitting in your own skin as a storyteller. Yeah, true. Cool. Yeah, it's, in a way, as uh, how you discovered the blank page and thought, <laughs> well, keep it in. That's pretty much how we rehearsed. Also, we, it's, we every mistake on the floor or whatever. It's. Half it's an opportunity. Is, yeah, it's an opportunity. Yeah. Crow uh, Crow uh, says at the start, "I won't leave until you don't need me anymore." At the end of the book and the production, he moves on. Uh, but does it mean that the father and the sons are done w with grief? No, like he said, like the boys have uh, a conversation um, right before the end. Mm -hmm. uh, father. Ha you can, you should maybe help me, Max. But <laughs> father, the despair will be gone, mm -hmm. but grief will still be there. He will still be grieving, mm -hmm. but he won't need a crow for that. Mm -hmm. So it's you in need your DNA. Yeah. yeah. So for the, f the 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 despair kind of grief, the the grief where you don't know where where mm -hmm. where to look for it, you mm -hmm. know, uh, this you need a crow for. Mm -hmm. But after two or three years. You will still be grieving, but you won't need a crow again. Uh, uh, Eric, you made the production Find Me a Boring Stone about a man who had just lost someone. In 2019, I saw uh, Beckett's Endgame here in Rotterdam. Yeah. Uh, also about mortality, and now yeah. there's grief is a thing with feathers. You could say three uh, plays uh, uh, about about uh, grief. Yeah. Um, what fascinates uh, you about this theme, or what are you trying to explore? Uh, I'm trying to explore uh, my things in my personal life. Uh, uh, my parents uh, died um, shortly after uh, uh, each other, 
five years ago. Uh, so that became a th grief became a theme, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, what's so great about now entering the world of Max's book is it's so extremely joyful and it, and, it, and it's so alive. Uh, Find me a boring stone. There was four or five years ago. It was very dark. I was. Mm -hmm. it, it just hit me. That was crow. Uh, that was part one of the book, the dad sitting in a, Correct. feeling numb and, 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 and Crow just visited, just entered my life. And now, four years later, there's, 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 there's music and lights and, and, and humor and, and it's so alive. And that Max, with this book, really uh, thought uh, me and us that uh, how to mourn better mm -hmm. in a way. Or how to mourn mm -hmm. that it's also about uh, life. The, the Max, the title of, of the book refers to a poem of uh, Emily Dickinson. Hope is a thing uh, with feathers. How do hope and grief relate to each other? Well, um, the, the putting it in the Dickinson line suggests that it's a thing that grows in the soul, which I think is is true. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also it also points to. Uh, uh, you know the other the other Emily Dickinson poem I use in the book is that love is all there is is all we know of love and it is enough the freight should be proportioned to the groove that we the space we make for ourselves is the space that fits us uh, outside society's expectations outside any crass and limited watered down kind of piss weak Christian idea of mourning or grief or everyone dressing in black in their uncomfortable funeral gear with a warm cup of tea saying, oh, he was lovely. No, he wasn't, he was a bastard, you know. <laughs> We've got to get past that, that fakery for the, good, for the good of all of us and that therefore pain and rage should be, you know, I, I'm very angry with the, um, with the commemoration industry, you know, people that put a poppy in the ground and then go off and spend money on, on warheads to drop on on the Yemen, you know, the hypocrisy there. Uh, I, do, I don't think we do, I don't think we do our dead any favors and I don't think we do the living any favors with that kind of um, banality of, of, of the ritual. So I wanted, what Crow brings is is a roaring, musical, tumultuous, uh, uh, you know, um, ecstasy. Uh, you know, I feel that the morning that I do, I mean, you guys, I don't mind telling you this, right? When I watched this play the other week, I went straight from this play and I was like, I'm not ready. I need to get this out of my system. So I got my folder down, which is where I keep all the letters from my dad's tragic life. And I and I unplugged and I felt when my kids got home from school, more pleased to see my kids than I have done in a long time. And I was joyful and I was full of song and, and pain and those things are the same. And I, I yeah, I guess that's, I guess that's why it's an interesting theme. I mean, like, Eric, just say the word, I'll write you a romantic comedy. But for now, I think, like, um, it, is, it is the big story, um, how, we, how we, you know, we're, we're, we're all dying, and, 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 but you'd never guess it from, from the way we treat one another, you know? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, Eric, this Sunday, uh, yeah. the uh, Theater Rotterdam will broadcast an, uh, a live stream version of the play. Why, why not a recording and, 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 and a live oh, yeah. stream? Well, we, we thought about doing a recording, but we, uh, it went off the table in, in a few minutes because that's what we do. That's, that, that's theater. We do it live and we, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that we, I mean, recording it brings on a lot of problems like which take should we get should we do it another time maybe get it better there's no such thing just do it we, we rehearse it for uh, for eight nine weeks we they can do it and if something happens that then it's crow mm -hmm. or then it's the blank uh, page is it different and to play without uh, with an, without an audience uh yes it is but knowing there's an audience at home mm -hmm. sitting on a bench uh, i myself have been a spectator of live stream and it's you're doing another thing sitting down on your bench. Uh, I plug my laptop in my television. I, I watch a live stream. It's a totally different experience than watching a recording. Mm -hmm. you, you can stop the recording. Mm -hmm. You can make coffee. <laughs> you can, well... Go to the toilet. <laughs> everything. But <laughs> when, when it's a live stream, you try to concentrate on it and, and get caught by it. W will the production be back on the boards in better times then? Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, okay. we, yeah. We're course. making plans. Yeah. 
and Max is going to write a romantic comedy. D did I get you right <laughs> for 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 Jakob? That would be great. Hundred percent laughter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, Happy uh, endings. J just one more question for you, uh, Max. Not about the play, but uh, your new novel, *The Death of Francis Bacon*, will be published in Dutch in June by your publisher, De Base Gebei. Um, uh, you said in, an, in a video message, it's a short book, shorter than my other short books, and it's my attempt to write as painting. Yes, it, it's, it's an appalling, um, uncomfortable, horrifying little book, uh, which it should be, because it's about these the, the, uh, uh, the fracturing mind of a painter who specialized in creating appalling images of human flesh twisted and torn and pinned into space. So... Uh, it's an attempt really to make uh, the reading experience close to the experience of looking at those images. So it leaps around, it's pretentious, it's noisy, it's repetitive, it's flooded with art history and sex and death and meat. Um, and I can only apologize to everyone that likes my novels. <laughs> 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 and how is it to write uh, as paint, as painting? I loved it. I mean, uh, as these guys have discovered working with my book, you have to think, how do you make a... How do you make um, uh, rat a rat-a-tat uh, with language? How do you how do you do a sudden booming, roaring, sentimental rush? How do you do smearing? You know, I want to I want the, the paint to the, the language to be very physical. Um, so it's an extension of my of, of what I've done in my other books, um, but it's also incredibly focused and bespoke to the work of Bacon. So it was like doing a, a kind of unhinged um, <laughs> piece of school homework, you know, it felt like a, a good, sticky, messy project. I, I really enjoyed it. And actually, I'm just turning it into a play for someone. And so I'm learning a great deal from watching what Jakob and Eric have done with this book. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to, to read it and, and I hope people will buy it at the local bookshop to support well, them. Well, we should June. also, while we're, while we're all talking, if you don't mind, we should, we should praise Saskia van der Linge my translator, mm -hmm. who made all this possible, really, with her incredible translation of, of um, Grief is a Thing with Feathers, and, and she's also done my other work. Um, and I think we've all, we all agree, you, you guys performing it and adapting it, she just has an, a beautiful ear for the language, and Crow, Crow particularly, he works so well in Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Saskia. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank my guests and the viewers at home for being here uh, with us. Uh, and I wish everyone a beautiful online streaming on Sunday, 23rd of May. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Max, for being with us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having you me. You still have to do crow. Ah, how do, ah, how do, how do I crow? Ah, ah. <laughs> thank you.